Okay, so as I was saying, things that are flashed to the right hemisphere, she can say. And things that are flashed to the left hemisphere, she cannot say verbally out loud, but she could be asked to draw what she saw or to pick it out of a group of items that she saw. Let me introduce you to Joe, who has a split brain, and you'll see this play out. I know left hemisphere and right hemisphere now are working independent of each other, but you don't notice it. Now, you just kind of adapt to it. It doesn't you don't have any feeling, any feeling different than it did before. Once Seven years ago, Joe had brain surgery to allay the effects of severe epilepsy. His surgeon cut the nerve fibers connecting his left hemisphere with his right. While the operation was a complete success, Joe's unusual case offers an extraordinary insight into the machinery of mind. This fiber system, the corpus callosum, is located midway between the two hemispheres. When it was surgically severed in Joe's brain, the transmission of information between the two hemispheres was halted. Michael Gazanica. What we can do is play tricks by putting information into his dis disconnected, mute, non-talking right hemisphere and watch it produce behaviors. And out of that, we can really see that there is, in fact, uh, a reason to believe that there's all kinds of complex processes going on outside of his conscious awareness of his left half brain. Joe, I'm going to show you some things. I just want you to tell me what you see. And here we go. You ready? Look right at the dot. Okay. Right. Okay, you ready? Look right at the dot. Grapes. Good. When Joe focuses on a point, right at the dot. Everything to the right of the point goes to his left brain, the dominant hemisphere for language and speech. So we can see here that when we flash a word or a picture, the Joe is easily able to name it. There we go. See it. Close your eyes and let your left hand do a little work here. Okay, what do you got there? Pan. Okay, very good. Now, when a word or a picture falls to the left of a fixation point, that information goes to his disconnected right half brain. And as we can see here, Joe is unable to name it. Joe is able to draw the picture with his left hand, the left hand getting its major control from the right half brain. Please draw. Okay. What do you see? Wheel. One side. I don't know where I saw it. So even though he can't name it, his left hand is able to draw out the picture of the stimulus of the picture or word that we presented to his right half brain. What did you see? So just close your eyes and draw with your left hand. Just let it go. Nice, what's that? Saw. Yeah. What'd you see? Hammer. What'd you draw that for? I don't know. What we have with Joe is a is a just a dramatic example of a neurologic case that really allows you this window into the non-conscious and how powerful non-conscious processes are at influencing our conscious self, our personal self. What Joe and patients like him, and there are many of them, teaches us is that the mind is made up of a constellation of independent, semi-independent uh, agents, and that these agents, these processes can carry on a vast number of activities outside of our conscious awareness. Even though that goes on, there's some final stage or some final system, which I happen to think is in the left hemisphere, that pulls this all of this information together into a theory. It has to generate a theory to explain all of this, all of these independent elements. And so, uh, and, and, and that theory becomes our particular theory of ourself and of the world. So from 
patients that do have split brains, it's pretty obvious that our hemispheres are specialized in certain things. If I were to ask you which of these two faces appears to be more sad, would you say the one on the left or the one on the right? Most people say the one on the right is more sad or, or looks more sad because our right hemisphere is involved in emotional processing but we're receiving information from the left half of each face. So therefore, most people would say that the one on the right appears to be more sad. So due to this hemisphere specialization and patients that have split brains and the technology that we have, it's pretty clear that while our left hemisphere and right hemisphere are specialized in certain tasks, they really do need to communicate with one another through that corpus callosum in order for us to live normal lives. You can see that the left hemisphere is important for um, identifying details, it's very analytical, uh, it likes logic, whereas the right brain is more creativity, it's more um, intuitive in problem solving. And despite what they said in the 1960s, we as humans are not left brain dominant. We need both parts of our brain. And in fact, we use way more than 10% of our brain. That's another myth that people think. We actually need all of our brain to be communicating with one another and working together in order to live normal lives and do things day to day. So I've got another extra credit opportunity for you guys. If you're having trouble um, understanding how the two hemispheres process uh, information in a split brain patient, you can go to this website, nobelpriest.org slash educational dash medicine slash split brain and play a split brain game. It actually will help you um, with any misunderstandings that you have. And for extra credit, what I want you to do is just send me, email me a little write up about what it is um, you found in the game and kind of the outcome of it. It shouldn't take too long. It takes about 10 minutes to play. And like I said, it will really help clarify any of that. So if you want this extra credit opportunity, email me your little write up about the game uh, by midnight tonight, which is Thursday. Thanks guys.